I understand it was different, but if there's anyone out there who hasn't played Super Paper Mario, simply because it dropped the Paper Mario turn-based mechanics for an action RPG approach, please fix that by trying this game out. I love it. It's one of my favorite Wii games. And surprisingly, one of the biggest reasons for that is its standout characters and story. It's really something special, especially for a Mario game. The story of Count Black and Tippy and their tragic quest of removing all existence due to immense grief over the loss of a loved one is kind of a lot for a Mario game, but it still somehow works really well, and some of the best characters in the game are Black's minions. While most of them are lovable and loyal doofuses to Count Black, Dementio is a bit different. Dementio has motives of his own, and is only working with Black because their means are the same. While Black wants to erase the universe out of mourning, Dementio wishes to wipe the slate clean and create a chaotic new world. And when Tippy finally brings back Black's senses after the party's battle with the Count, and Black admits that the world should continue, well, that just won't do. Dementio calls upon... <laughs> the hum... <laughs> Dementio calls upon the hypnotic suggestion used to turn Luigi into Mr. L, a recurring enemy from the game, and the two combine to become... Uh, something. And that something is Super Dementio, the final boss of Super Paper Mario. The fight itself isn't anything too special. You play your platforming smart, dodge some attacks, and it won't be too long before this abomination goes down. But it's here because of how insane and memorable this boss is. This incredible set piece with wild characters on display, all while the ultimate show, an absolute banger plays in the background. It's definitely not what I expected when reaching the true final boss of this game, and hey, it wasn't the first time something unexpected happened in Super Paper Mario, and with how much I love this game, I wouldn't have it any other way. Spider Spider-Man was a real pleasant surprise for me. It was able to balance a cinematic Spider-Man story with a large, fun, web-slinging adventure almost perfectly. In a New York recently suffering from a criminal power vacuum after the capture of Kingpin, numerous bad guys try to take over, including Mr. Negative and his freeing of the Sinister Six. Mr. Negative is a highlight on his own in how he ties to Spidey's personal life. But the real star here is Peter's relationship to Dr. Otto Octavius. In this universe, Peter Parker works for Octavius in his lab. And through the course of the game, we see firsthand Octavius' mental state decline, and his anger towards Osborne, who's wronged him over and over again. This leads him to becoming Dr. Octopus, joining Negative, releasing a toxin in Times Square, and taking the anti-serum hostage. It's up to Spider-Man and his new sleek armor suit to take him down. It's not easy for Peter to fight his mentor, and he insists that Osborne will face charges if Octopus just stops terrorizing the city. The fight ensues, and it's great. Like the rest of the game, a perfect mesh of cinematic action with tight gameplay. It's really something special. The first phase, you have to time your dodges while flinging debris you find around the roof to stun Doc Ock, so you can truly capture him in his webbing. This then leads into the second phase, where the ground has been set alight, so you have to use your swinging capabilities to get in close and lay the final blows. All the while, there are some, I'd say tasteful, QTEs to sell the intensity. And then, finally, the emotional kicker. Octavius reveals that he knows it's Peter in the suit, meaning he's fully aware that he isn't just trying to kill Spider-Man, but his protege as well. Now convinced that Doc Ock can't be saved, a final standoff, on the side of Oscorp Tower. Octopus is damaged, but Spidey's out of webs. An emotional back and forth fist fight ensues, and finally, after getting stabbed, Peter is able to grab the neurochip on Ock's neck to ruin the arms, causing Otto to fall. I love this fight, and you know, while it might not be perfect, I think it's a perfect way to end a game like this. It's a really well done emotional payoff that took me by surprise, and I'm glad it did. A memorable way to cap off a truly memorable game, especially in recent memory. Oh god. Oh shit. Okay. Uh, I gotta talk nice about Sonic Adventure 2, don't I? Okay. 
Alright, so, I, I don't like this game. Uh, while one third of the game modes are fine, uh, one third is extremely shallow and dull, and the last third is one of the most annoying experiences I've ever had the displeasure of playing. I think Shao Gardens are overrated, and I've never understood the points of them, and I think the story and game look real subpar, especially now. Now, with all that out of the way, I think the Bio Lizard is my favorite boss fight in the Sonic series. First off, it comes after a pretty cool team sequence, traveling through the core of the arc, completing a bunch of sub-levels as each of the playable characters, which, while not perfect, is a satisfying batch of zones to complete. All characters are present except Shadow, who finally arrives after being convinced to help the rest of the team, and to stop the zone's boss and penultimate fight of the game, the Bio-Lizard. Shadow's prototype? Brother? I don't really know. As stupid as the story is, I think the setup is pretty cool, honestly. And the fight that follows is great! It's a challenge, but not cheap. It's a great test of abilities with a character I like playing as in SA2. Engaging, and easily the most memorable boss to me. From the Shadow Balls, the sweeping, to climbing up its... Eggs? To hit his weak point. Not to mention a great use of Shadow's trademark grind rails. And supporting me is, unironically, a cool as f track for this boss fight. So yeah, this is probably the biggest disparity on this list when it comes to what I think of a boss compared to their game, and maybe that's why it garnered enough rep in my eyes to make the list proper. And because of that, it's always going to be memorable to me. I'll always remember this one and enjoy it when it comes up when I play this flawed, wacky, and sometimes fun game. Alright, so you're playing Metroid Prime. I know you are, because you're cool, amazing, and have great taste. And Ridley, in his new cyborg-like form, is already making his presence known. Being the reason you crash land on Talon 4 in the first place thanks to his meddling on the frigate. And he's always lurking, whether it be through his subordinates in the space pirate labs, or one of my favorite moments in the game where he's seen, larger than life, searching for Samus in Fendrana Drifts. But, you have other priorities, exploring the planet and recovering the Chozo artifacts from the various regions. And you've exhausted every nook and cranny on the planet. You've finally found them all, and have returned to the Artifact Temple to gain access to the hold of the Metroid Prime, and then... Oh, we're doing this now, huh? What follows is probably my favorite Metroid boss battle, starting with a sequence where you have to shoot Ridley out of the sky while dodging his bombing runs and other aspects of his arsenal. It's exhilarating and cathartic to finally knock this bastard down to the ground. Oh, but even without wings, Ridley is still capable of tearing you to shreds. Now a one-on-one -on -one ground battle. You have to dodge jump stomps, lasers, and the beast himself in order to wait for your moment to strike. When his mouth is open, a well-placed charge shot will get him to finally keel upright, exposing the core weak spot for you to unleash a barrage of missiles. When he's finally weak enough, the artifact temple reactivates and deals the final blow to the weakened dragon, sending him into the abyss below. Such a fleshed out, great boss battle, the perfect way to start the final act of this game, and a cinematic fight against one of gaming's best villains. You know, surprisingly for being the most noteworthy franchise in video games, one with a fair share of entries I adore, it's hard for me to pick out some truly excellent boss battles in the Super Mario series. Sure, there are a few real bad ones, and there's definitely some that stick out as memorable, but compared to some of my favorites in all of gaming, there's just something a little bit lacking. Hell, even the entry that did make this list probably wouldn't have if I was just talking about the battle itself. But there is something worth talking about when considering the build-up, the music, the set pieces, and the personal impact of the final Bowser battle in Super Mario Galaxy. This final level is incredible, a gauntlet of great platforming and a game nowhere near lacking in that regard. A challenging showcase of what makes Mario Galaxy so great, all leading up to the final confrontation against Bowser. The stairway leading up to Bowser, with the arena for our fight in the background, is just mm, such a good set piece. And the music for this whole level and fight just perfectly captures the grand feel this game pulls off incredibly. While I had my digs earlier, the fight itself is still very good. 
a three-phase fight that serves as an expansion of previous fights and mechanics from the game. From timing spins against Boulder Bowser, to using the ricochet plants to land a hit, to the final showdown in an incomplete star, tricking Bowser to smashing the protective glass, burning him until the final blow is landed. It's not just before and during this fight either. Afterward, it leads into one of my favorite video game endings, period. So I'm gonna give it some props there as well. A superb send-off to one of my favorite games. It's hard to find much wrong with this killer battle. Spoiler alert, the best boss fight in Hades is Hades. Yeah, crazy, I know. What the game had been building up to at this point, fighting through the first realms and bosses and dying on every run on your escape from hell, even if you had no idea concerning this game's story, I'm sure most had the feeling that, yep, dear old dad is waiting for me at the very top. And when you get there, it's brutal! So many crazy attacks, summoning random mooks from all across hell, and his own cast to counter yours. A true test of your abilities, and proficiency with the build that you've created for this run. You'll definitely take a few deaths before, like every other fight in Hades, you learn, you adjust, and you put down the threat as Hades finally falls. Uh, suddenly, second phase, Dad gets way more aggressive with a new adjusted onslaught that if you're not ready for, will completely destroy you. It's an incredible journey of a boss that feels satisfying to slowly get closer to beating and... When you finally do, it feels so, so good, and leads into the beginning of Hades' magnificent endgame. And it's still challenging on subsequent runs, and as soon as you finally get comfortable, it becomes emotional when he finally lets you pass without a fight during the game's normal ending. You really feel like these are no longer fluke victories, but a mastery of the game that has allowed you to properly surpass your predecessor. You've earned this ending, and there's no better feeling a game can give. If you know me, you know not to be surprised that there really isn't much turn-based RPG representation on this list, especially older RPGs. They have just never really clicked with me, unfortunately, and I know that there's some incredible boss battles that I've missed out on as a result. However, also very much like me, if there is one exception to that rule of thumb, it's Chrono Trigger, one of my favorite games ever that defied all of my expectations. And one primary example of that is in my favorite boss battle from that game, one that you'll probably never expect coming from me. It. Is it Magus? It, it, uh, yeah, yeah, it's Magus. So, shockingly, I love this character. Amazing demon elf design with a cool scythe and a villain of one of the game's central arcs, who becomes a party member later, which is so cool! But before that, he's the boss of one of the coolest dungeons in the game, the Fiend Lord's Keep. And this dungeon's no cakewalk either. Some hard normal enemies and the Guns N' Roses trio to keep you on your toes. But trudging through it is worth it to reach a dark room. Flames slowly light a path for you before an ancient sigil reveals itself and the dark mage shows his face. Before goading to the party pre-battle, the black wind begins to blow. Okay, give me your best shot if you're prepared for the void. <sighs> What follows is definitely the toughest battle up until this point, with his trademark barrier change mixing up his elemental weakness, along with poison spells and a strong physical attack and defense. His weakness to Frog's Masamune, too, is a nice story touch. Then his second phase, where he only spends time charging up his ultimate attack, Dark Matter, which will kill if not at full health. So, do you try and get an attacks to finish him off, or play it safe with more heals in advance to ensure your survival for another round? It's such a great fight, and works incredibly well off of every aspect I love about Chrono Trigger. And, like most of Chrono Trigger, it's still memorable 25 years later. <laughs> <laughs> 